I want to know everything there is to know about you. Now I'm going to introduce you. You must have spotted her by now. She's always there. Don't I deserve love? Somebody has to like me best. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Don't Know Her podcast. I'm Scott. And I'm Michael, and we're back again to talk about another actor who we believe deserve much more from Hollywood in their career. And we have two very exciting things to say off the top. First, this is our Hollywood mini season. Hollywood. Hollywood. <laughs> Halloween. Hollywood. <laughs> oh my goodness. I am not prepared uh, for this. And a sec. <laughs> <laughs> our Halloween uh, mini series, and secondly, if you could hear that little cheeky giggle um, of me messing up straight away, that is our very special guest. She's a theatre maker. She is an awesome person, and she's someone I want to be when I grow up. Uh-oh. Kate Comboy Fisher. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here and uh, talk about a Halloween icon. It's an actress that a lot of people would think is kind of very relevant and, and, and making a lot of stuff, but it's uh, it's Christina Ricci. So uh, actually she's the Halloween icon, to be to be perfectly honest. Um, I'm gonna see about 100 Wednesday Adams, I'm sure, this Halloween, as you do every year, you know? Um, but yeah. yeah, I think she's just um, a perfect kind of example of uh, a, a long career for a woman in Hollywood that sort of kind of really sadly petered out. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think, like, if we're talking about someone that's iconic for Halloween, for specifically, say, our generation, so late 20s, 30s, like, in the 90s, Christina Ritchie was sort of, like... She was that girl, yeah, she was everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Casper and Adam's family in particular, um, as you say, like, Wednesday Adams, she's just so cool. And then even when she got older, doing, like, Sleepy Hollow, and now, I guess, doing Yellow Jackets, she just seems to be around this sort of like odd yeah. Halloween-esque because she's not a scream queen in terms of she's not running upstairs away from some sort of no evil she was always the, the kind of she was the kind of eye of the storm she was never like the victim she was always kind of the weird girl which I think as a as a weird girl around that time it was nice you know <laughs> um she was sort of she was sort of ahead of her time though I feel like all the Anya Taylor Joys and the Mia Goths she would have really kind of taken off there's something about Christina which felt particularly back in the 90s, fresher or more exciting. It wasn't like she had Mm -hmm. to be this kind of mannequin-esque, sort of dollish, sort of young woman, which I feel, as much as I love Mia Goth and Anya Taylor-Joy, they do feel a bit more statuesque in a certain way. And Christina Ritchie felt more like it could be us. Even kind of as that Wednesday Addams, I I remember watching and thinking, you know, that, that I can see myself in that character more. I bet sometimes you wish it was still just the two of you or less. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, even when she's given um, like in Prozac Nation, I think, which is sort of a up and down film. But I think um, her performance in that she's playing this like really particular character and um, it's very relatable. You're still watching her and saying like there she she manages to kind of imbue it with this realness and authenticity and you're and you're kind of going like i could i could see myself doing that maybe you give me a hard time about sam you never loved sam how could you oh was i mean you can't take it the happening chick that you are (laughs) i could relate to that i could do that being very telling about myself here it's an interesting one uh the one note that i took over and over again, especially when watching her younger performances, was that very Mm. natural. She's a very natural performer. There's nothing cloying about the way she uh, functions as a child Mm -hmm. actor. Um, However, I still think there is something otherworldly about her, which is why I do understand your comparison to especially those two, Mia Goth and um, Annie Taylor-Joy. I think the Mia Goth comparison came for me because I always think of when I think of Christina Ricci, she's almost like a silent movie actress because she's able to, it's those huge mm-hmm. eyes, obviously. <laughs> she has these, these enormous eyes and this really expressive face. But I do think that she underplays it a lot more than someone like Mia Goth, who I haven't, I haven't seen Pearl yet, but from the kind of, the, the scenes that I've seen really is like playing that up. But I think Christina Ricci always went kind of, um, she she kind of almost played against her kind of type. 
she sort of uh, acted against and, and sort of down into realism, but she, she couldn't fight that she looked kind of otherworldly and had this thing about her that was sort of um, yes. effervescent. Yeah. Angelic. There we go. Angelic. <laughs> yeah. And do you remember when you first clocked eyes with Christina? I do. It was Casper. <laughs> Yeah, I Casper was my Halloween movie, actually, not The Addams Family. Um, I remember as well, my babysitter was the spinning image of, um, yeah, Christina Ricci and Casper. And, you know, when you're young and it's like... Well, I was going to hope you were going to say Kathy Moriarty because it, 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 it <laughs> yeah. might... It, that it would might be amazing. Like that would that. be incredible. Yeah, we, we did routines now. Um, but, uh, I, you know, when you're younger and it's like the women in your life are always the most beautiful sort of like your mother is the most beautiful woman you've ever seen or so to me it was like Christina Ricci is like the most beautiful girl I've ever seen and and it was really nice as someone who has also has a a bit of a five head and huge eyes (laughs) to see someone who is like but she is I mean she's presented in the movie as such a like normal girl they don't kind of play up the fact that she has this kind of um otherworldly energy which is which is really nice and I think that what you were saying about that she's not cloying when she's younger She's sort of, she's always been a bit adult or like knowing, sort mm-hmm. of wry, um, mm-hmm. which is, which makes, I think, Casper still really watchable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because she's kind of the, the most mature character in yeah. Casper. <laughs> she definitely is. <laughs> she definitely is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all, all the contraptions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, wild. And what about you, Scott? Do you have an early memory of Christina? For me, I think um, it's the Adams Family values I actually think I saw before Adams Family. Uh, and I remember it being on the background and I can specifically remember the scenes from the camp um, towards the kind of middle to end yes. of the film. Yes. Though That is what sticks in my head most of all. I remember being at my auntie's house, the TV being on in the background and that playing out. I reckon that has to be my earliest uh, uh, memory of Christina and what a joyous one to have um, yeah. what about you Michael I'm sensing you're a Wednesday Adams kid too oh for sure but I think really the first time I knew who she was and when I saw Adams Family Values which again I would have seen the sequel before the first one in fact like people we used to hang out with had the video and I remember being that kid that would go over and be like all I wanted to do was watch the video again I didn't want to play with those kids I just wanted <laughs> put to put the watch video, video on or <laughs> but of course you know that you were not allowed to do that and um, but really, my first memory of her is the Shoop Shoop song music video with Cher and yeah. Winona Ryder. Because she would have been in it. So, and that would have been, you know, played so often. Oh, she was teeny tiny in that. Yeah. yeah. So I guess by proxy kind of mermaid, but I hadn't seen mermaids at that age. Um, but that song, and I obviously love Cher. Um, <laughs> spoiler. <laughs> Do um, you? <laughs> So, so yeah, no, it would have been Adam's family. And yeah, just like you, like I remember them being tortured and um, having to watch the sound of music in the cabin to be taught a lesson and her like doing that kind of crazy smile that she's forced to do to be like, yes, we're cured before she then like burns down this pilgrim set and like <laughs> ties up the, the blonde haired little girl um, to a stake to burn her. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. I love her. Yeah. So yeah, just like what Kate was saying, like she just represented such a like fun sort of menacing but playful and not that dangerous. She just kind of stood up for herself and was mm. very confident in a way I guess we didn't have. Yeah, absolutely. I think um you're kind of like I'm relating to a small murderous child. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that me? Yeah, <laughs> me when I burn down <laughs> the pilgrim set now. Um, but yeah, but also, I mean, it's quite a feat to be in a film with like Angelica Houston and be kind of one of the icons of it. Oh, like, wait. At, it's how old was she in that? Maybe 10 or 11? Yeah. Yeah. And particularly the second one where she gets, she's kind of a co-lead, like she's leading her, her plot mm. of the story when they go to the camp. And yeah, like you say, like Angelica Houston, Raul Julia, um, mm-hmm. Christopher Lloyd, Joan Cusack giving like the yes, campus oh sort goodness, of performance yes, you can imagine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like, and yeah, Christina Ricci has more than enough moments to make it her own and have her own stamp on it. And without like overshadowing anyone. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, equally, the same number of people dress up as Morticia, you know, I think it was yeah. a really strong kind of female, mm-hmm. actually, Halloween film. 
you know, female. What about Debbie? Film. What about Debbie? <laughs> what, where Justice is for Debbie. Debbie's flowers yet? <laughs> I'd love to see a Debbie costume, but I just think it's something that doesn't, it's not, um, it's not sort of uh, simple enough, like two plaits yep. in a black dress. You're, you're, you're away in a true. hack, you know? FYI, for anyone listening or for us here, you can buy a Debbie Jelinski costume for $35 <laughs> on eBay. I have looked you... into it for the greater good. <laughs> um. You can probably just keyword search pastels on Pretty Little Thing and be away as well. <laughs> oh, I love it. One of the best, one of the best things. In fact, I, was, I used that as an insult. It's like, oh, I forgive you all these awful things, <laughs> yeah. but I will not forgive you pastels. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Before we properly get into the films more, let me give a little rundown of Christina Rishi because I hope there's a few little bits here that are totally news to you because it's been a bit of an interesting ride to research Christina, and um, particularly it's something she did as a child, which <laughs> I think is both admirable and scary at the same time, but sets her up oh. for the person that we know. <laughs> I'm she didn't murder anyone. That I just want to flag that. <laughs> that we um, know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That we know of. True. So Christina was born on the twelfth of February, nineteen eighty. Her mother was a former model and an estate agent. Her father had a range of jobs, including a gym teacher for the people in the U.S. and PE teacher for us. Um, he was a lawyer, and also importantly, while she was a kid, he was a primal scream therapist. So as a kid, she'd come back from school and he'd be doing this therapy um, downstairs in their basement, it sounds like. So Primal Scream, for those who are not aware of, is like where you kind of scream your deep feelings and frustrations and all that and vocalize them. So wow. probably quite um, an intense house um, to be <laughs> in. Um, she does describe her like going to do the Adams Family. It was much saner than... Um, <laughs> Her time at home and actually her relationship with her father is it seems quite complicated and they're not been in touch for quite a long time mm -hmm. um but here comes the real juicy uh, gossipy <laughs> gossip <stuff. laughs> she really loved doing drama in school and when she was eight there was a school production of the 12 days of christmas somebody else in the class had the part she wanted so she taunted him until he hit her and then she went and told the teacher, and then she got the part in this play. <laughs> oh, terrific. Oh, my God. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm both like, because this is something that happened to me as a kid. There was a girl in particular that really taunted me, knowing well she, I'd get in trouble and she could be played the victim and get a treat mm. if I hit her. And she always did it. So reading it, I was like, oh, that's bad. But also, I'm like, I expect nothing less of this. <laughs> <laughs> We're all guilty. We're all guilty. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Yeah, also, you know, in my head, I don't know if you were doing it, Scott, because I could see you kind of counting in your head. Um, she's an Aquarius. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I thought you were like, what does that make her? Oh, that <laughs> what does that mean? Does that, does that line up to what you imagine of Christina? Yeah, Aquarius, the innovator, uh, stereotypically unusual, offbeat. The kind of stereotypical Aquarius is always like Phoebe Buffay from Friends, okay. like very kooky. Yeah, so cool. I think it's sort of her vibe, for sure. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I could probably, like, any sign I'd be, <laughs> I'd be like, oh my god, yeah, Virgo, she's a total Virgo. <laughs> That's kind of my I'd opinion find... on Star Science, but... <laughs> yeah, I'd find a way, you know? Um, so from this very successful produ well, school production, as successful as school production could be, because a theatre critic saw it, and from this, she got into the ensemble oh sorry ensemble is the wrong word she was in the background of two snl sketches she was not in the ensemble of snl when she was eight years old <laughs> but that led to mermaids which she does in uh, is released in 1990 when she is only 10 years of age star starring alongside oscar winner Cher, winona ryder and bob hoskins like incredible and she's so mm -hmm. wonderful and natural and like we'll talk about mermaids but lord i think she's so charming in it and it makes total sense that then she is quickly followed up by the Adams Family in 1991, Adams Family Values in 93, Casper in 95, cementing her as we said before as this 90s kid actor and kind of instant nostalgia for people like us. Mm. At 17 she moves purposefully away from these childish roles and she has talked about this in that 
at this time, instead of casting like 20-somethings or even 30-somethings, if we think about Grace, in, in teenage roles, they started casting actual teenagers. So she's playing quite a complex role in Ang Lee's The Ice Storm in 97, playing this kind of sexually frustrated young woman um, who's also dealing with her, uh, the adults in her world, dealing with their sexual interests and frustrations. Um, terrific film. Um, she's also working with John Waters in Peck, and she's in Buffalo 66, The Opposite of Sex. Um, these are all in 98. And with The Opposite of Sex, she's Golden Globe nominated for Best Actress and also uh, gets nominated for the Independent Spirit Award. So doing really well so far. Sleepy Hollow then follows working with Tim Burton. She works with Sally Potter in The Man Who Cried. In her 20s, she starts producing her own films, Prozac Nation and Pumpkin being two of them, happening in 2001, 2002. She also gets to work with Woody Allen with anything else, and um, works alongside Charlize Theron in her Oscar-winning role in Monster in 2003, is a romantic lead as a pig-faced uh, um, <laughs> girl <laughs> in a rom-com you never knew you may not have needed in Penelope. Um, <laughs> and um, then really is pushing herself and getting some of the best um, notices of her career with Black Snake Moan in 2008. Um, there are, from this point on, um, lots of movies, but they somehow like it dwindles, like who she's working with, the types of films. Like there are films like Bellamy and Mothers and Daughters, which have terrific cast. They're just not at the same level of like Ang Lee and the Ice Storm or, or Opposite of Sex or anything like that. And it seems to just kind of continually decline, like her profile from that point um, on film. In TV, like, so she would be known to some for being a recurring character in Alan McBeal in 2002. But in 2011, she starts a series where she's a proper lead, Pam Am, which I've never seen. Has anyone here seen those? No. That show? I have seen a few episodes. Um, it's pretty camp. Yeah, it's, it's, oh uh, yeah, it's fun. Yeah, okay. I wouldn't. Yeah, it's enjoyable. I, it's not high drama, yeah. And then she returns to TV with Lizzie Borden, Took an Axe, and then the Lizzie Borden Chronicles in 2014 and 2015. She does Z, The Beginning of Everything, which is where she plays Zelda Fitzgerald in 2017. And of course, very recently, is in her Emmy-nominated role, um, Yellow Jackets, of Mitzi, I say. Mitzi? Oh my God, I just finished the whole season and I, I'm... Going to put all my money in that it's Mitzi, and I apologize if I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Yellow Jackets, alongside Juliette Lewis and Melanie Linsky. And just a terrific show where these women are getting lots of really fun things to do. And also she'll be seen very soon in Tim Burton's Wednesday uh, Adams TV show for Netflix. Um, but it is strange. Like I find it really strange that her like film career has kind of... I keep saying dwindled and I don't even like that mm. word, but it's like just gone like the profile it was. It just yeah. seems mad that it didn't continue or they're not people like jumping to make work with her, even in a nostalgic mm. way. Like we're living at a time where, you know, Hocus Pocus 2 is being made and all these other things. And maybe she's actively like, I don't want to revive any of these other things. I just want to, you know, do my interesting work. But you still think she could get things like Monster or some, something off the ground. Like Patty Jenkins, who directed Monster, she owes a lot to Christina Ricci, I would argue, and should be getting her some amazing role in something. So that is her in a nutshell. Um, her work, anyway, her... We don't cover her uh, personal life here, Kate. Sadly, it's not a gossip. Um, <laughs> not, not yet. A cheap time rag. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> if someone wants to pay us, we'll definitely do that. Yeah, give it oh, 10 yeah, minutes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then she went out with this guy. I, know. <laughs> I feel like she's pretty private, so, yeah. Yeah, I actually don't know that much about her, which is why researching yeah. um, her for this, because mm. she talks about her personal life at times quite openly yes, or refers yeah. to things which you could then google and figure out but if like i i didn't do that I focused on the movies but she is fascinating and she is really private as you say um and it is clear um that she made a choice to make smaller films that were more interesting she didn't want to make these big budget movies anymore she didn't feel comfortable with the attention which 
can you imagine like I can mm. not imagine being a child and having to go through that and then to go through puberty and to mm. go through that particularly the sort of stuff if we think about women or say someone like Britney Spears was talked about in the early mm. 90s like to be a young woman in the spotlight like that seems like not worth it so yeah all for her if she, and she's having a wonderful life she's just is enjoying it but here we just wish there was more glory and I think there's at least one bit one place where she should have been getting awards uh, attention if it should have won an Oscar if not been nominated so Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> so keep listening um, <laughs> yeah well, shall we? Let's start. Let's start with like focusing on some of the films, and shall we go to Casper? Mm. If that is your first entry, Kate. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, Casper, she's kind of in a, a prepubescent sort of uh, space there. She's not a child, but she's definitely not kind of in her opposite of sex sort of um, era. So um, she's still got that kind of really cheeky confidence, but um, it's it's sort of I don't know. It's still very playful. Um, I feel like she gets a lot more serious as her career goes on. Um, just like her aura, her vibe, everything. Um, so yeah, Casper is sort of, um, I don't know how to describe Casper. It's not really a comedy, um, but it's definitely, it's, I mean, I, I laugh, but I'm <laughs> genre wise, I, I laugh every time, but I'm not sure that it's, it's really a comedy. It's always like family film. And I'm, I, yeah, I think family film is probably the safest way to describe it. Although there's parts of it that are like those, those ghosts in it were sort of very, but there's this weird thing in the nineties. I think it was a hangover from the eighties where they had these like overly scary things in children's films. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> and the ghosts in Casper always used to, I always used to fast forward through the video when they were on. I just thought they were really disgusting and strange. Oh. I'd be like, when's Christina coming back? <laughs> I love her. Well, you haven't even mentioned, because you're talking about stretch, stinky yes. and fat so. The, uh... Stretch, Stinky and Fatso, yes. <laughs> That's their government names. <laughs> yeah, they're, go- they're their full names. I mean, I, I yeah. assume they're not their names when they're human before they die. Um, I, wouldn't I don't know how they got their names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sort of reminds and... me of in like The Hunchback of Notre Dame where they threw in the gargoyles because they realised that this film is really inappropriate yeah. for children. They're like, throw in some goofy gargoyles. <laughs> Well, that's the thing, because the uncles, these three ghosts that we're talking about, they, they're not the villains, really. Like, the story is no. about Kathy C- Moriarty and Eric Idle, who are these, <laughs> these people, <laughs> tried, like, treasure hunters. They inherit this, mm. the most, like, a ghost-orientated house you could imagine. <laughs> like, it's, like, screaming, like, mm. ghosts live here, which is wonderful. It's very aesthetically pleasing. Um, and they get different people to come in to try and help, so they get the incredibly attractive Bill Pullman and oh. his... His, his daughter, as you describe, Christine Ritchie, um, coming to live in the house. And then it's kind of about Casper. Well, it seems like he wants a friend at the start. It seems like he mm. wants a girlfriend then when he sees Christine and Rishi. But um, it's, that's the story. And then he has these three uncles who basically just terrorise them, as you say, just as these kind of like comedy troupe. Yeah, um, they're sort of not the scenes weird. you really remember about Casper. <laughs> the scenes with Fasso, no. Stinky and Stretchy. <laughs> Although having said that, like they kiss Bill Pullman, they turn, they make oh. Bill Pullman turn into like Mel Gibson and Jenny um, Wood <laughs> and stuff. Like the, the things they do are wild. Like it's wild. Yeah. You're sort and of you know, like, like if if entities had this power, we'd be we'd be pretty screwed. <laughs> and to to go sum up like what you were talking about with a comedy family film, this was written by the same people who did the Animaniacs. So oh. it like in that way, it's like that's it's so cartoonish. Like I, I was mm-hmm. so impressed. Like it all, um, like special effects have aged so well, and it's because they've kind of gone this not naturalistic at all. It's just they're mm-hmm. they're proper cartoonish ghosts. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Sorry. And in a way, it's really interesting because she's sort of the only not cartoony character. She doesn't have any really goofy scenes in it. Things that are kind of imposed on her like there's goofy parts in it but she's sort of always the person with her hands on her hips saying like this is ridiculous you know i saw a ghost and it had a head and it was round and it was white and see-through and honey no maybe dad please do not think i'm as crazy as i thought you were and um i think that uh when you're especially like a, a young 
child, you always feel like if you even have the slightest bit of responsibility that you're always the person who's, <laughs> this is yeah. ridiculous, you know, because I think it's a really intoxicating feeling for children to feel like they're um, more responsible than their parents. <laughs> Yeah, I think that whole idea adds into what I was saying before about her not being a precocious child star. And in this she is, exactly as you say, she's the most naturalistic performer here. I was fascinated to read that um, Christina Ricci said recently that she thinks this is a terrible performance of hers. Uh, she really doesn't like it, she thinks it's, it's awful and um, she wasn't trying. She can sense she wasn't trying. But I think it's exactly that which makes mm. the performance really work because she feels so relaxed. She feels so natural. And as you're saying, as the kind of the responsible, the one in charge, you believe all of that maybe because, like she says, she wasn't mm. trying. Um, but a very interesting watch for me. This was my first time with Casper. Uh, I had never watched it previously, so this wasn't a childhood watch from, for me. Uh, and all I have to say about it is that Casper's a fucking creep. Yeah. He is a creep. Cat. Hmm? Can I keep you? We're all supposed to think it's okay because he's cute for like half a scene. No. No. It's, yeah. And she does, she clearly says, get away from me. And I know mm -hmm. because he's a ghost and all this sort of stuff, maybe she was, like he might insinuate, like, oh, she's just scared and everyone does that. Mm -hmm. It's like, but no means no. And I... <laughs> even for Casper. Yeah, come on, Casper. Yeah, even... Be friendly yeah, even in your title. Need to be invited. Come on. <laughs> and when the tagline's like you're like a, the friendly ghost, it's like, well, he's overly friendly. Like, <laughs> Yeah, he's too friendly. Yeah. He could be a little he's... less friendly. Yeah, yeah. stay away from this sort of thing. <laughs> and then, like, I don't know if it's is it a spoiler to mention the end, but to be like... To have a wish to become, or like to become magically a human boy, mm. and it's kind of just a disguise to get to kiss yes, her as a. Yeah, but but yeah. I'm not sure Christina Ricci's character knows Even likes that is Casper. Yeah. I mean, I just it's all a bit strange, and and she's just gone to a new school because they've just moved to this house to try and find the ghosts. Um, it's all it's all just a bit creepy. Yeah. Um, no, exactly. I was sort of charmed by it, though, despite its um, creepiness and uh, other bizarro elements. Yeah, well, it's it, yeah, it's not one I think if, if you're an adult, you need to revisit, perhaps. I think it's Absolutely if you have nostalgic no. sort of allure, or you want to see or campiness, a, or, or Bill Pullman. Or you want to see Bill Pullman, yeah. Yeah, yeah cutie. In a cardigan. He's such a cutie. Yeah. Oh, he's so cute. <laughs> Although, he's... I will say, what, while you were sleeping, also gives good Bill Pullman in the That's a cardigan. probably better Bill Pullman <laughs> in this context if you're watching for Bill Pullman. He gives it. He he gives a pretty good performance as well, though. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. he's he's a very good straight man, but there's something like very inherently <laughs> sadly. Wish he was a gay well. man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't mean it in that context. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but also, yeah, because he's, there's a lot required of him. He's like this. Yes. Incompetent, yeah. both a ghost hunter and father that's grieving from the loss of his wife and the mother of his yes. child, and is then dealing with these like really awful ghosts. And um, but. <laughs> But he does well. I mean, he's just, I mean, yeah. but if he wasn't good looking, maybe I wouldn't be saying this. Like, I love But I think say there's I'm... something like, he, he's trying very hard in the film. I always feel like in his performance and like his character is trying really hard. And that sort of goes really nicely with what you were saying, like Christina Ricci didn't try at all. And that's sort of like a classic coming on to teenage um, and parent kind of relationship, you know? Yeah. Okay, this is a great segue that I cannot ignore. Let's talk about mermaids. So Please. I've already told I've told everybody that I absolutely love it. But like, what what are your opinions of it, guys? Oh, actually, before I do that, let me describe the film. It is about Cher, this wonderful mother who wants to be independent and has her sexual desires and everything with her young daughters, Winona Ryder, who is. Um, discovering the world and she's very sheltered um so she's doing things like she thinks she's pregnant from a kiss and goes to a doctor to see if she's pregnant and then she has another daughter played by christina rishi who is so young and is so adorable and she's really into swimming and she's just so sweet and she's like she brings them together when on a ride and share because they have quite a um a lot of conflict in the relationship oklahoma was great i like living there yeah i know and you'll love living here when you get used to it yeah, and when you get used to it, we'll move and everything will change again. Life is change, Charlotte. Death is dwelling, dwelling on, on the past, past or staying, staying in one place, place too long. 
And then Bob Hoskins turns up because why not? Because we love him and he has a relationship with Cher and he's like a father figure. And they, it's just such a lovely film. Um, and that's probably really um, patronising because there's more to it than it just being a lovely film. It's just I love spending time with these characters mm. and just really enjoyed it. Um but there's an interesting dynamics between all these characters. So yeah, what what did you guys uh, think of it? Is this the first time you've seen it? I had seen it many many moons ago, and um, I rewatched pr- the majority of it in pieces. Um, and I think that, that you were sort of saying, oh, it's more than a lovely film, but it's sort of it's very hard to get lovely films anymore. They're sort of like harrowing or they're hilarious, you know? Yeah. And it's just such, like, it's... And I think that that's down to the warmth of all the performances, particularly Christina Ricci. Um, like, she's just adorable. And I mean that in a totally not patronising way. Like, she is adorable, as in, you want to protect her and, like, see her do well and everything like that. And I think she's a really good... Um, it's sort of like you could imagine Winona Ryder as her almost. Whenever I watch it, I always go like, this is sort of like a timeline. But although Cher is kind of the odd one out. But the, the, the two daughters are sort of on this kind of continu- continuum sort of. And um, you just see that it's it's like this is the one way it could go. And this is the other way that it could go. And I just, yeah, it is just a really lovely film. And Bob Hoskins, as you say, is just lovely. He's lovely. <laughs> I don't know a nicer word for him. He's sort of randomly in a lot of films of this period, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, it, it is. I this was my first watch of Mermaids as well. Actually, this is maybe going to be a trend here, where I'm just coming to films that <laughs> that you've seen many moons ago. Uh, but we have in common that we think she's adorable. The the, the top word on my notes in capital letters is adorable. This is amazing that this is her first because again, it's just so. It's just so refreshing to watch her be this good and and just so joyful and full of light as she is in this film. And they all are, and they all bring different sorts of light because what a trio to watch of these three women. Um, but Christina, little Christina Ricci, is is the light at the heart of it. But watching their dynamic is, is a really, really special thing. And I think of one moment in particular, which is just a joy to watch on screen, where Winona Ryder comes back into the house and she comes into the bathroom and she sits down on the toilet and Christina Ricci's holding her breath in the bathtub. So we've got her holding her breath in the bathtub and counting. We have uh, Winona sitting on the uh, the toilet and then in the other room, Cher's lazing on the bed, uh, reading a magazine. And just the, just the three of them in that moment just filled my heart with such warmth and it was kind of like... This film can do no wrong. It's a, yeah. it's a lovely thing. And I enjoyed it tremendously. I think there should have been more even awards talk around some of these performances. Because mm. I think Cher and Winona are really, really wonderful. Yeah, Cher yeah. is really, yeah. It's it's sort of like Cher is such a superstar. But she always has this tremendous warmth. And no, in no more film more than Mermaids, I think, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Obsessed. I'm obsessed with Cher. Like I, yeah, I, I, yeah, she's so good in this. And Winona Ryder, yeah, they, I don't know how it wasn't um, awarded. I mean, I do because mm. people would have seen this as a, a woman's film, and it would have needed yes, to have like absolutely. someone dying of cancer or something <laughs> really, really, really dramatic to make it. But that's why they just don't make films like this yeah. anymore because they don't win awards. You know, they just make people yeah. very happy and touch them. But yeah. you know, that's. <laughs> Well, on that note, please go see Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris because that is a <laughs> film I think you could say is lovely. Oh. Um, and I assume it's not getting awards. Um, yeah, but um, but different, very different to Mermaids. Um, yeah. Um, now I, I feel, I'm feel i feeling a bit sinister after all this talk about it being lovely. Um, you look it. I am sinister. <laughs> um, do you want to talk about Buffalo 66? Like, Because that's kind of part of her transition, I guess, to being... Mm wilder or a bit more adventurous with her film choice and um, i'd mm-hmm. never seen this before this is one of the few oh. films i'd not seen of christina Ricci's career um and i didn't really know what it was um it was going mm-hmm. to be but um i guess to to sum it up it's it's a film where vincent gallo who's also the writer director he's a star and he needs to go back to his parents and he needs someone to come with him. So he's been mm-hmm. released from prison. He finds Christina Ritchie and forces her essentially to come 
back with him to meet his parents, mm-hmm. played by Angelica Houston, and Ben Gazzara. Mm-hmm. And it is a very, you know, independent late 90s movie of American cinema. Um, I imagine at the time really, really exciting. Like, it's still exciting to watch at times. It kind of is... Uh, I don't know, it's kind of, it, it still uh, has that energy, which I don't know if we get so much anymore. Like, it's really polished what the sort of independent American cinema mm. is now that was then, whereas it was a bit more rough and ready. I mean, it was made for nothing. Um, mm. The behind the scenes sounds pretty awful. Like, Vincent Gallo yeah. sounds like a pretty nasty Horrendous individual. Yes. Yeah. And this was the first time Christina Ricci was without her mother on set and she was being forced to wear certain clothes and behave certain ways and it just all sounds very negative but the film itself is super like absolutely mm. super. like i really really liked it and i got mm. a lot out of it did obviously feel really uncomfortable watching moments knowing what the behind the scenes would have been like for instance christina rich couldn't drive um that sort of car and so he was getting increasingly frustrated that she couldn't do it um mm. Yeah, I liked it. I'm assuming, Kate, this is one that you've seen a long time ago. Yes, I uh, rewatched it recently. Um, it's, um, yeah, I have very mixed feelings about it. Christina Ricci is brilliant in it, and I think is sort of um, the light in the film, um, because I just think Vincent Gallo's character is just horrible. I never, I never finished the, it's sort of one of these things, oh, I see reviews and stuff and they say, oh, but you sort of like him, you know, he's one of these characters that you can't help but like, at no point in this film do I like his character, no. you know, um, I'm practically screaming at Layla to get out of the car, you know, um, yeah. and it's sort of, it's also a very, I hate to say it, but it's, it's quite a male fantasy film. It's just, it's, it's, I don't know, it's not, it's sort of pseudo-realistic in, in parts, but you sort of, I think it should have been more fantastical if we're supposed to believe that she falls in love with him after the way that he's treated her for the entire film. Um, uh, but she is just phenomenal in it. And mm. I think the, is it a two minute sequence of her in the car that's just the camera on her face? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you know, like she just has so much going on all the time and just makes it watchable. <laughs> And Angelica Houston is very good as the horrible mother as well. Yeah. Um, and Ben Gazzaro? Gazzaro yeah, Gazzaro, sure yeah. Uh, I mean, he's believable as a scumbag. So. Yeah. <laughs> they, they were fun. Like, that, that, that dinner sequence is really fun to watch. Like, there's a lot of yes. great exchanges yeah. between them. Oh, no. I think Billy is the most handsome guy in the whole world. Who, honey? Billy. I think he's the most handsome man I've ever seen. Billy who? This Billy. Oh. Ah, I can't stand it when he grows his hair long. Yeah, and Christina's yeah. like making the most of this forced um, situation yeah. she's in, and she's trying to reclaim it. Yeah, like like in the photo booth scene, she makes it yeah. fun. You know, she's just kind of. Um, but you're sort of screaming at her, like, please, anyone else but this guy. <laughs> Come on, what is that? What? what are you doing? You just made me waste two dollars. Get up. Come on. I was making it fun. You're, you're missing the point. Two dollars. I just wasted two dollars. And th- this is like an escalation of like a Casper to this. It's like just, mm. you know, and I, because of watching them so close together, I watched Buffalo 66, I think, and then Caps, Casper, and I was like, Yes, yeah. Jesus, I She's really sort hope. Of... Yeah. Yeah. She's sort of this angel on the Christmas tree that you're just sort of like doesn't deserve these people, you know. And I think one of the hard, one of the many horrible things Vincent Gallo said was that the reason the film didn't do well was because she was too fat. <gasps> and um, what the fuck? Yes. Um. Which every time I watch it, I'm like, she is the reason this film did well. Yeah. Like yeah. she is the only reason this film did well. Even with Angelica Houston, like if someone else had been that, been Layla, you know, I just think she makes the film. Um, yeah. Yeah. I that I agree with I I do like this film uh, <laughs> I 
I men. saw this film because I was. <laughs> um, I I think you liked it as well, Michael. Come on. Oh no, uh, I do. Uh, I do like uh, it. That's yeah. what I think both of us. Men. Oh, I see. Okay. I don't hate I don't... it. I don't. I certainly don't hate it. You know, I wouldn't leave if someone put it on. It's just difficult. I think it's fair to hate. Like I would completely say, like grand. I think there's a lot to dislike about it, and now I dislike it more based on some of the stuff you you have uh, enlightened me to mm. there. Well, that's but... another conversation. Art and the artist, you know. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> but he is. I mean, he's he's. Oh, has is a tricky person and after this brown bunny was an absolute tank and then there was a lot of shit going on in that one too so mm -hmm. it's no wonder that gallo's career has uh fizzled out pretty swiftly after that um but the reason i have seen this film uh, over far more watched previous films that i hadn't seen uh is because i there's not many angelica houston films i have not seen and how could i resist the the reunion of these two it's exactly as you say that christina ricci is what makes this film work and then it makes me sad to think the experience was bad for her because otherwise it was a very strong platform mm -hmm. for her to prove herself as a gifted performer which she is so let's go a bit further then into her like older career and um, where they're really trying to like find I guess stereotypical or typical vehicles for a leading woman with Penelope so she's in a rom-com like I you know you can imagine all sorts of people would be in talks or discussions or about the role that um, Christina plays of this woman who is incredibly rich with parents Catherine O'Hara and um, Richard E. Grant and, you know, she should have men falling for her. Um, but she has a snout, um, a pig snout, <laughs> and um, very well done. Like, I think she looks mm -hmm. quite adorable. Like, I can't, mm. I, you know, I, I, that's one part of the film. Like, but she's still very adorable. Like, I don't I don't think there's a problem. Um, but anyway, mm -hmm. um, the whole thing is a fairy tale esque um, setup, and it's about her trying to find someone, enter. James McAvoy, who's very young. Um, uh, sorry, he's not very <laughs> in fact, he's, he's young. very young. <laughs> no, what I mean is <laughs> this is 2008. <laughs> so he's younger than he, we know him now, is all I mean. Sure. He's not a young, sure. he's not like a boy. <laughs> and he, He's not like Dune young. <laughs> yeah, he's not. He's not Dune. Yeah, this isn't call me by your name style. Um, <laughs> stuff. Um, he comes in and is really interested in her and you know maybe there's a reason he is maybe there's all, all other uh, motivations i really enjoyed watching her in a more kind of semi-powerful role just like opposite of sex is another example where she is playing someone who is you know deciding things she's quite she's like but i don't want a whole new me mother sweetheart please please i like myself the way i am so i kind of enjoyed watching her do that and i thought it was a shame that we didn't get like rom-coms or some sort of romantic comedy drama sort of movies built around her specific sort of personality and talent but penelope is not that movie it, in my mind anyway you guys might absolutely love this movie um but it wasn't for me um no i i don't love this movie uh <laughs> and I actually found the, the snout very distracting. <laughs> I couldn't stop looking at the creases in the side. I was like, oh, this is, this is weirding me out. <laughs> um, it is, it's nice to get to see her do the more, the kind of the childish shade, which is strange to say when we're talking about someone who's known as being a child actor. But like we were saying, she was kind of playing against that as a child. But then in this, she is kind of reverting into what that mode could have been. Uh, so it was interesting to see. I kind of enjoyed the Reese Witherspoon onward stuff. I sort of enjoyed their dynamics. So when that got into play, I was like, oh, I'm enjoying this. I can go with this. Like, uh, I was expecting to really not enjoy it, um, but, I, but I had some fun with it. But no, I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's one I'd point anyone towards, perhaps. Yeah, it's um, it's something I watched. Um, I know it, it's one of these stereotypes. I have a friend who's very, very interested in James McAvoy, and so just watch. You know, when someone's very um interested in someone, and they just watch every single film in the entire sort of uh pantheon, and um, was not one that particularly stuck out to me. But in the context of her career, I think it definitely would have been nicer to see her in more kind of light rom commy roles. But I think it is very on brand for Christina Ricci that this is her version of a rom-com where she has a pig nose. And I do agree that 
the the wrinkles were very distracting. I sort of wish they had either made it like less grotesque or more grotesque. It's sort of this uncanny valley of yes, exactly. strangeness, you yeah. know? It's... And it has this like Disney lighting on it. And it's like you yeah. need to go for a style with it or something. Like, I just there is don't something think off Hollywood it. was brave enough back then to make women ugly. I mean, even Princess Fiona is like pretty cute, you know? There's something... Yeah. It's like, oh no, she's fat. <laughs> like, she's hideous. Yeah, it, it, like, yeah, yeah, if we're to believe a prota- like a male protagonist is go- or antagonist in this case is mm. going to fall in love with the female character and he was unusual casting to be honest as well like i wouldn't think james mcavoy rom-com either so in that way it was a good dynamic i suppose it's all unusual like richard e grant is kind of unusual and, and things like that but it's all all these things don't make it interesting unfortunately it's such a shame okay guys so now i'm going to ask you what do you think if you were to think she should win an oscar would be her oscar winning role I think you're probably referring to Monster. I think you might be referring to Black Snake Moan. So, but really, both of them are really great. But it's Monster. Like, I, I honestly, from the off, so I remember watching Monster. And, like, I, I mean, I guess anybody that feels like an outsider anyway, mm. this will, this moment will relate to them. But for whatever reason, I have this, like, imprint in my head of Christina Ritchie being in a gay bar... And this would have been before I went to a gay bar properly. Being in a gay bar and someone attractive comes to her, comes over and asks if the seat taken. And Christina, with all of the charm that she could, she has, um, which is a lot, she says no, as if like, yeah, you can come and sit down. And then the woman says thanks and takes the chair away. And it breaks my heart. It's both like Christina's reaction to that, but also mine. So when you when you then enter... Um, the titular monster, um, I guess, uh, Charlie Theron as Aileen Wernos. Um, is that how you say her name? Aileen? No, Aileen. Aileen, um, Aileen Wernos. <laughs> yes, it is really, like, it's all believable. Like, there's some, I just think she is the reason that Charlie Theron is so good and the film works as a whole. And there's so many moments, like, from that opening scene to them talking in the bedroom, because she's coming to terms with her sexuality and her Mm -hmm. identity, and she's awkward, but also excited and also nervous. And also then is, like, a little bit selfish and also nervous because Charlize Theron's character is totally, like, digging her nails into um, Christina Ritchie Shelby. Um, I just think it's such a fascinating performance um and it's no surprise like when Charlize Theron wins the Oscar she says my incredible incredible leading lady Christina Ricci who I couldn't have done this film without you are truly the unsung hero of this film because really the story of Eileen Wernos for those who do not know listening um is a woman who worked as a sex worker and then according to Monster has a very horrific sexual attack and then starts killing the people that are employing her for sex work and using that money to live with her partner, which in this film is a fictional um, character called Shelby, played by Christina Rishi, and it leads to her imprisonment and being sentenced to death, um, which is all a real story because I don't think I've been very clear. <laughs> it's all of story, just certain names have been changed. And, you know, as with all of these things, um, I guess we'll never know the whole truth on a lot of it. But pretty awful um, things happened. And I, you know, back back in 2008, um, I hope I got the date right, um, there wasn't that many mainstreamish queer films. Oh, 2003, you're right. 2003, there wasn't that many mainstream queer films, really. I mean, we do, we get certain ones, a bit like Boys Don't Cry, which is a good example compare, or comparable to Monster in like a really tragic character, a real life character, um, a real life person, I should say, being characterized into this morality sort of tale so kind of like victims of you know the queer community but I don't know something about the warmth between Christina Ritchie and Aileen Wernos um, played by Charlize Theron just makes me really love this film and those performances Are you a prostitute? Yeah Why man? 
I don't know. Uh, people like pay to be with you. It's wild. Men must just line up to be with a girl like you. I guess. I don't know. Not really. You know. Yeah. Right. And I've just so much time for it, even though I think it's quite complicated and uh, um, easily could be torn apart, I'm sure, by somebody much more academically minded or something than me. But my emotional like view uh, side as an audience just really likes it. And it's because of Christina Rishi. Mm. I am. Um, it's interesting what you say that you think it could be torn apart. I was expecting to go back to this film and not like it. I was kind of a bit hesitant to watch it again. In my head, I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't think I feel... Cu- Something about this makes me feel strange. Mm-hmm. But I th- I think it's brilliant. And I think it's really sensitively handled. I think, I think the opposite. I think I would challenge someone to tear this apart because mm-hmm. I think it's incredibly strong. Stronger than a film like this deserves to be perhaps and that is the magic of patty jenkins i think alongside these two incredible performances the chemistry is amazing as amazing as very few other on-screen couples especially maybe queer couples that we get to see on screen amazing she is wonderful she is warm um in her warmth works against the abrasiveness that we get initially from charlie's is um eileen buenos but charlie's is justifiably Oscar winning miraculous like it's so much more than an ugly uh, baity performance it's vulnerable it's confident at times the attraction that she has for um, Christina's character feels way beyond surface and vice versa when you see Eileen you're like why why would she go for this on a surface level but you get it straight away because of of what Charlize is giving off in this performance. Um, they're incredible together. And the final moments, the final goodbye moments, made me cry. I thought they were incredibly strong and, and it worked. I think these are the absolute top tier performances. I think it's just a phenomenal film. Um, I think it is kind of the gold standard for if you're going to make a movie about a serial killer, not looking at any Netflix series in particular. <laughs> um, but I think it's it's just, I think I watched it when I was far too young and I remember my mother telling me, like, you cannot watch this film because there's a particular scene with a sexual assault that is quite graphic in its, in sort of, and it's sort of, that for me framed the whole film and I thought it was going to be a sort of blonde kind of, you know, one scene after mm. another of sort of horrificness. And then when I actually watched it, when I was, again, probably far too young, I think it was 14, and then I rewatched it recently, um, I sort of was taken aback by how tender it is and how sensitive it is. And I think that that is, again, Christina Ricci, who is sort of going against this wry knowing character. She's sort of totally naive and open, um, which um, is so attractive, obviously, to, to the Eileen Warnos kind of... Um, character even though she is a real person was a real person but um i think that there's a few scenes in it again the bar scene where they initially meet i'm out of here oh, are you sure get your fucking hands off me you dumb dyke i'm not gonna fuck you for fucking beer okay stop wasting your fucking time i wasn't trying to fuck you i just wanted to talk to you and i thought that if i bought you some beer maybe you'd talk to me i'm just trying to have one decent night out you know just talk to someone before I have to go back to my parents' closet. I, I'm i sorry. You don't have to stay. You stop skin on my fucking nose, okay? I'm just trying to be straight with you. It's just the tension of not knowing, because even though you know how it's going to end up, it's sort of, it's directed in this way and it's acted in this way that like, you don't know how it's going to end. You sort of think they're not going to end up together, but they just sort of can't stop talking to each other. And yeah. it's just done really well. And and I think it's a testament to the chemistry, but also mm. that they obviously trusted each other a lot. Sure. And that's sort of why Charlize probably mentioned Christina 
in her speech because there was obviously like a huge level of trust there and the ending always makes me cry yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's such a like vulnerable sort of film to watch like i find that as a viewer like that's why that one that moment at the beginning at the bar with her and the yes seat. yeah and it just for some whatever i watch it reminds it places me back when i was a teenager and was uncertain how the world would receive yes a yeah. gay person there's also way, a scene also, yeah. Yeah, sorry. There's also a scene in the motel and they're having, I think, maybe their first big argument. Yeah. And I think that everyone has been in that position where you're sort of in a relationship that's like totally out of your depth. I'm going to go any place I want to, okay? Anytime I want. Not on my fucking friend's car, you're not. Fine, fine. Then I'll walk, okay? I do not want to sit here alone all the time. I want to go out. I want to meet people. I, I want to hang out with people without you fucking scaring them off. She sort of plays this this two sides to it where you're sort of, you don't know if she loves Eileen or she just loves being in a relationship. You're yeah, sort of, it's okay. very interesting, you know. Yeah. Um, I do think they loved each other, but I do think that Shelby's character is very interesting because just like so young in every sense of the word, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she definitely, I think there is something about being um, you know, alert, alert in by attention and being like, mm -hmm. it's you. Like I like the you. drama like, I, of it as well. Yeah, the yeah. drama as well. Yeah. yeah, which is what makes the ending work because otherwise, if Christina Ritchie wasn't like kind of mysterious, I guess, with like her motivations in that sort of way, the ending would not work. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of how their relationship ends, I just think it's perfection. And she lost the Oscar to. Rene Zellweger in Cold Mountain, which oh. grand. But Does anyone makes, remember it that? Absolute, <laughs> it makes no sense to me. Well, I do. I mean, because I love paraphrasing. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. Her about roosters and sheds and whatever else. She's like storming into rooms, shouting about. Anyway, it's um, sort of yeah. Yeah, Monster is very wild. dirty film though. Like every time I remember watching it when I was younger, and it was sort of like watching a VHS tape of a murder. <laughs> it's like very grimy or something, you know. I think I was just fascinated with the idea that there was sort of a woman kind of serial killer and then it's sort of fascinated because it was like the first film I think I ever saw with a, a queer relationship in it which is kind of mm. sad that it's a serial yeah. killer film but you know well this is a big problem of queer cinema pre well like in the 90s mm. and 80s like would there there's that and that's where I think monster like I was saying earlier could be mm. taken down but now that we have so many different sorts of stories monster kind of proudly sits amongst them if that makes sense yes, if we were just yeah. getting negative stories then sure. there's a problem. But now, because we have so many, um, you know, we have lesbians in Carol being kind of melancholic. And that's okay. Yes, there's no murder. Yeah. They're just like driving around. <laughs> she sort of frames the relationship for the audience. Well, for me, when I'm watching it, it's like I've watched it, I think, three or four times now. But I always want it to work. I sort of always want Eileen to just kind of, I always want them to work out, you know. And, and it yeah. sort of never does. So, and yeah. it's it's not... It's not like Buffalo where you're like, leave him, you know, like yeah, just yeah. leave, you know, you're sort of like, this could really work if things were different, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh. yeah. And yeah, and that's it. The frustration is like America or capitalism or society. Mm. Like, and that's how, anyway, but that's, that's, um, it's just such a rich film. So I like of all the films we've talked about so far, Monster, well, that's a lie. I was gonna say Monster, but Mermaids, all of them, watch all of the films, do exactly what we've done, <laughs> but in reverse. Um, well, let's talk about, like, I guess a, a much more recent film and one where I also think, as, as you mentioned, Kate, that she's absolutely brilliant. Black Snake Moan, where she plays a nymphomaniac. This, <laughs> um, this is the description of the film because I couldn't believe that that was how simplified We're not it making a judgment. <laughs> exactly. It, it, she's a nymphomaniac and her boyfriend, fiancé, played by Justin Timberlake, <laughs> mm -hmm. is going off to <laughs> war, Iraq war, right? Is that what it is? is that, are they specific? They are specific, aren't they, about that? I think it's Iraq. Yeah. Um, and so I remember so, being kind of shocked that they mentioned the Iraq yeah. war in a film about an infomaniac. Anyway. She literally, like, wobbles and, like, is gyrating and, like, falls to the ground, as, like, once he leaves. And um, then we meet Samuel Jackson, and who is giving, I would also say, one of his best performances as this very conservative man whose wife is leaving him and he's not he's not in the best place um Christina Rishi decides to have a wild night out and long story short after another kind of graphic awful sexual assault scene um she ends up 
on the road and uh, unconscious, found by Samuel Jackson, who decides, let me help this woman, so I'll chain her up in my house. <laughs> <laughs> and because yeah. of her behaviour and what he hears about her, um, he basically knows she's a nymphomaniac and he thinks religion should save him, so he thinks he's doing a great thing by mm-hmm. having her changed. Um, Fuck you been doing to me? I ain't laid a hand on you except to break your fever. Like I said, get this goddamn chain off me! Look, girl, you've been running wild on me. Between them fits and them fever dreams you having, I've been chasing you all over this place at night. Well, I'm woke now. You can take this off. Quite an elaborate chain, like thick, like like if you read, really, it's, yes. like, it's like a graphic novel of chains. Um, yeah, and that is the setup of the story, and it's about their, mm. I, I guess, it's about their relationship. Um, and about her <laughs> nymphomania taking <laughs> taking hold. Yes, yeah. Uh, it's it's. I watched it again. I was the the theme for this is I watch things that I'm too old, uh, too young to watch them even. But um, yeah, I I remember watching it and sort of thinking it was going to be a lot sexier than it was. It's not actually like it's sort of um off putting mm. the sexuality in it it's sort of i mean there are scenes in it where it's very obviously meant to be kind of titillating but um it's it's sort of maybe that's just like as a woman watching it that i find it quite off putting but it's they really like there's bits in it where she's like moaning but it's almost like pain she's yeah. sort of you know um it's it's sort of it's like a morality tale almost that you're sort of thinking like this isn't a real story so you kind of remove yourself from the judgment calls a little bit i suppose um that's my excuse for liking this film <laughs> i i i i was gonna say i think the setup is good i'm not even sure the setup is like i guess no. if i was like a heterosexual cis man watching this there's a fantasy element to it um mm. perhaps that's what it's aiming at and it's about like was that fantasy good but watching it you're just like let her free like you should mm-hmm. like locking her up. Like she clearly needs help, but she what she does not need is a God fearing person to have her yeah. chained up to a thing while she's wearing see, barely anything. Maybe I misread because I sort of didn't really like Samuel L. Jackson's character, and I didn't think you were supposed to. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I was sort of like, this is like you're just sort of watching it happen. Um, I certainly didn't like Justin Timberlake's character, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I see vigorously shaking your head. <laughs> That's so interesting. Yeah, I just assumed we were supposed to like Samuel Jackson because he was singing and like the town liked him and all these sorts of I'm things. I'm sort and of rooting because... for her the whole film. And um, I'm sort of like, of course, I'm like hit this old like guy in the back of the head and like make a run for it. But at the same time, you're like, she is obviously sick and like unwell. So you sort of don't really know. You don't you don't know how to kind of. Yeah. I mean, I think that they frame it that she's unwell. You could argue yeah. that she's not, and she's just, you know, a very empowered sexual being. But the way that when I watch it, she doesn't seem kind of empowered. Like, it's not developed enough, the character, to be, like, clear yes. what yeah. we're supposed to be doing. And this is the thing about Samuel Jackson, too, because, it is, like, his behavior, I was just like, where has he, like, rationalized this? Like, what, mm-hmm. what is, like, like what, at what point does a character, no matter how, like, off the wall the tone of it is, decide to chain up somebody Mm-hmm. it's a it's a mucky sort of film but it is it's an interesting film i am glad i've i've now seen it she she does this sort of feral thing very well and whether it's in in the context of this as a nymphomaniac or where we've just seen her before be kind of just can't be tied down can't be pinged down the um the Woody Allen film that I can't remember the name of. Anything kind of else, yeah, yeah. She has, yeah, else. That's perfect, she yeah. has that so, ear. Yeah, she's very like that in Lizzie Borden as well. Which okay, I've right. Since I've seen, yes. And she does that very well. And and I can therefore understand fully her her casting in this. Um, it's, it's also full of memorable moments. I think the film is edited very well. And I think the music choices are very strong. The blues music and the kind of the haze throughout it does give it a, a very immersive feel and mm-hmm. particularly the scene where she is attached to the chain and she runs outside and the chain jolts and she falls it, it i can almost feel that scene I, it's it's cut very effectively to to really last in your mind um and it's kind of exciting it's tense it has these moments mm-hmm. uh, i don't 
I didn't love the film overall, but but I think there's really strong and interesting stuff in there. And she, again, like she is in so many of these things, is the standout, uh, of course. Yes. I think it's really her film. Like, that's one of her best performances, I think. Like, in a film that I don't particularly enjoy. Like, it's not something I'm like, oh, I'll sit down and watch Black Snake Moan with a few digestives <laughs> and a cup of tea. Oh, that's Can't nice, wait though. to see this woman be punished for her sexuality again. Oh, <laughs> but um, what's it called? <laughs> But I sort of, I don't know, maybe I just thought it was one of those films where it's like two people dealing with trauma, both yep. wrong. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I wish he, I, but I wish he was given the opportunity, that character, to, to make more wrong yeah. decisions. Like, it's taken away from her so quickly of like... The ending is also really yeah. weak, where she's sort of like, Whoa. I'm just going to yeah. stay. Yeah. And you're like, it, what? <laughs> That's not the way to it's resolve It's just like, this. because if you think of like Captive, or like whatever <clears throat> happened to Baby Jane, or Misery, mm-hmm. and all the, like... I feel like there is purpose behind those captivities yeah. and the characters' journeys and stuff. Yeah. I just don't think that it's drawn out in the same way. But They should have really gone yeah. for it and made it, you know, like a horror. <laughs> yeah. You know? Although I wouldn't have wanted to see her be, like, attacked or assaulted any more than she was in the movie. No, no, I was yeah. thinking more, you know, <laughs> Justin Timberlake. <laughs> okay, Jane Grant, yeah, super. <laughs> Perfect. His character's fine. It's just I think he's so weak in this film. Like every time he's on yeah. screen, I'm sort of rolling my eyes. <laughs> well, you know what Olivia yeah. Wilde says: musicians are naturally good actors because they perform anyway. <laughs> well, it is a movie that feels like a movie. You know, <laughs> it definitely is a movie. <laughs> um, and I mean, we I actually don't know if you watched this, Scott, but we all said we were going to watch this most recent fi- one of her more recent films i don't know if we did or even if it's point talking about it but 10 things we should do before we break up did, it, did I we all watch this, this. <laughs> i watched it, it. i haven't oh sorry. my lord no That's scott okay. you you get a a prize for being <laughs> smarter than us <laughs> i yeah it's it's yeah i only watched it because an actor i really like hamish linklater is in it who oh, okay. he is the yeah he was in um Midnight Mass, which was the um, sort of follow on from Haunting of Hill House and the Haunting of Bly Manor. And, yeah. Uh, th- he plays this um, very uh, conflicted priest in Midnight Mass and he's just mm-hmm. phenomenal in it. Um, mm-hmm. So I thought, I have to see more movies with this guy. He's just really, really interesting. And looked up this film and then, oh, Christina Ricci's in it and was bored to tears. <laughs> it's such a boring <laughs> film. Like, so, like, I couldn't even yeah. tell you. Like, my notes stopped. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't know what happened after. I think I was like, I was watching it, but I, I you know, I've been like, oh, let me yeah. do something else. The and chemistry like, isn't even over. great, you know? No. It's not like before midnight or before sunset or before sunrise where you're like, they're no. basically talking nonsense. It's like listening to two college students talking in a cafe. There was actually something I wanted to tell you. Well, I think I know what you're going to say. I, I can explain. I'm pregnant. What? Ah, uh, I'm pregnant, and I have two kids. You're pregnant with twins? No, <laughs> no, no, I'm pregnant with your child, uh, and I already have two kids at home. <sighs> Are you okay? Hamish Linklater is not related to Richard Linklater, right? They're not oh, in yes. any way yeah, related. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> I think, if I remember correctly, one of his parents set up Shakespeare and Company or something like that. Oh, wow. um, so, yeah, he's like a proper Shakespearean theatre actor and is married to Lily Rabe of wow. um, American Horror Story. Yeah, yeah, so... Wow. Well, good for him, but he just made a crap film, so that is... Um, I mean, it's fine, but yeah. Um, it's a shame, basically, I guess, why I'm bringing it up and why I'm glad I watched it, that she's ended... Uh, not ended her career, but her career is at this point <laughs> where she's making these sorts of films. At the end of the episode about Christina yeah. Ricci, I'm so happy she's ended her career. Yeah, exactly. Oh. And I'm glad she's got to this point. And no, I think it's really sad. Like, I'm glad, like, mm-hmm. Yellow Jackets is giving her lots of fun. Like, she's very much supporting to the other cast in that, but she is, she is getting some fun things to do and getting kind of major recognition. So hopefully this will turn at some point mm-hmm. and she can make her kind of you know, independent um, movies that she wants to make, but on a different scale to 10 things yeah. we should do before we rewatch 10 things we should do before <laughs> divorcing or whatever it's called. <laughs> whatever it's called. <laughs> whatever. No, before we break up, yeah. Um, mm. 
But I love her. Is there any other movies? Because we she has such a good um, filmography. Is there anything that we've not touched upon that you want to shout out about because you particularly like it or don't like it? The well, uh, the question I put to you as well is that is what is your favorite Christina Ricci performance? Is yours Monster Michael? By yeah, by a long yeah. shot, and that's kind okay. of a personal thing, but also, um, yeah, I just think she's terrific in it. Yeah. What about you, Kate? Not my favorite film. I think Monster is my favorite film out yeah. of everything she's done. My favorite performance is Prozac Nation. I think she's oh, really, then I'm, really I'm incredible I'm, in Prozac Nation. Must I must catch that one then? It it didn't even really seem to fly into my radar until I was doing some reading mm. today, and I was like, I really should have probably caught. Yeah, this it's one. like it's a very it's uh, she plays a real person um, who has BPD, and she has a lot of scenes with Jessica Lang, and you're sort of like anyone who's <laughs> standing out in a scene with Jessica Lang is pretty incredible. But um, she just does this like these hairpin turns. Um, in her mood and her acting and everything and you believe it like constantly throughout the film I always believe her um and it's it's sort of one of these films that um if someone else did it you might think oh this is kind of Oscar Beatty but she just does it in such a like low-key authentic genuine way that it's not it's not showy you know yeah oh nice Um, and what about you Scott so I guess easily for me because there's there's places I can refer people back to. My favorite films of hers and probably performances are Adam's Family Values, which we did touch on, uh, which I think is amazing, and I think she is truly sensational in in, in it. And there it, there is a reason that Wednesday Adams has lasted so long uh, in the minds of children, especially at Halloween time. Uh, but also the ice storm again her as as a uh, much younger performer it, it asks a lot of her as a young performer in terms of the uh, the character arc and and um the things that it asks uh, her to do uh, but i think it's a fantastic film and she is unbelievable in it um alongside a lot of other really amazing performers. But you can listen to us talk about the ice storm in our um, Joan Allen episode, and you can listen to us talk about Adam's Family Values in our Joan Cusack episode. So please feel free to dip back there uh, should you wish more of, uh, of these films. And also Lisa Kudrow's episode has the opposite of sex, which is also a really yes. striking yeah. film. Um, so yeah, all in all, I'm just so delighted, Kate, that you brought um, Christina to us. Absolutely. Yeah, so am I. I sort of remembering films I haven't thought about in a very long time. Uh, love it. And I'm going to be less delighted if you beat me in the quiz that um, Scott has prepared for us. <laughs> <Uh-oh>. <laughs> Sorry, that sounds much more threatening than now turning into <laughs> Christina Ritchie. He's going to be so disappointed. Um, <laughs> but yes, uh, quiz incoming. I hope you're both feeling ready for this spooky themed quiz. Well, what we would expect nothing um, less in this Halloween episode than spooky. I hope you're not scared easy, Kate. <laughs> I'm already shaking. I can't see it, but I am trembling. Just like Christina Rishi at the start of Black Snake Moan. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> Slightly less uh, gratuitous, but you know, the trembling's there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, hopefully the thing that scares you the most is not witches and you're actually endeared to them and love it when a witch shows up in a film. Um, so, I mean, this was kind of just like a spooky themed thing, but I also just always assume that Christina Ritchie has played a witch. I guess it's because Wednesday Adams, we kind of think of her as a sort of witch character, but she's not really, um, and elsewhere I think there's like other horror films she's been in and she maybe just has that like sleepy hollow you're mm. like oh is she maybe a witch in that and in fact at one point I think it's commented that she's that she's got something witchy about her but no she's she's never played a witch even though she's um played alongside uh the greatest witches of all time and by that I mean Angelica Hughes. I thought you were going <laughs> to describe people in real life as witches and I was like where <laughs> where is this going <laughs> where are we going here yeah this is a real interesting turn okay doke. so what's going to happen here is this is an audio round. Okay. Uh, so you're going to take it in turns to hear a clip of a witch in cinema. And what I want you to do, uh, and each question will be worth two points, is name the actress playing the witch and the film that that witch has appeared in. So which witch? Uh, so 
<laughs> which witch? Oh, there we go. I mean, it was right there in front of me. I was trying to think of a punny title and I couldn't, but there we go. Which witch? Oh, well done, Michael. Too easy. Um, <laughs> Ten points. <laughs> yeah. And which of you would... Which? Hey, hey it's happened again. Uh, which of you would like to go first? Should we let our guest go first? Yeah, oh, he'd like I'm to. I'm nervous, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Witching hour. Let's do it. Wonderful. Okie doke. So, uh, as Michael has very kindly deemed, which witch? Here comes your first clip. That is correct, Longbottom. To blow it up. Boom. Boom. Wicked. But how on earth are we going to do that? Why don't you confer with Mr. Finnegan? As I recall, he has a particular proclivity for pyrotechnics. So I think I might have, I might have uh, gotten that. <laughs> Fabulous. Who is that witch? It is Maggie Smith in yeah. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2? Yes! Part 2, amazing! Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous work. I thought you were trying to do a Scottish accent as 2? Part 2? <laughs> <laughs> it was beautiful. If that was your Thank Scottish you. accent, I loved it. <laughs> uh, of course, Maggie Smith as Minerva McGonagall in the final instalment of Harry Potter The Deathly Hallows Part 2. Well done, Kate. That puts you on two points. Michael, coming at you now, your first witch clip. What is your name, son of Adam? Uh, Edmund. And how, Edmund? Did you come to enter my dominion? I'm not sure. I, I was just following my sister. Your sister? How many are you? That is a witch I'd love to find in the forest. Tilda Swinton. Um, uh, in the Chronicles of Narnia. Sorry, my mind... Or the line, the witch in the wardrobe? I don't, I don't know what the There we go, called. that's its full title. <laughs> okay. Yes, the Chronicles of Narnia, the line, the witch in the wardrobe. That surely was Tilda Swinton as the... What do we call her? The Snow Queen? The White Witch? Something to that effect. Snow Queen, right? I, um, I just don't know. It's yeah, not a book I think I know it's where. the Snow Queen. Uh, for good reason. Um, I'm joking, it has plenty of charms. Uh, well done, <laughs> Okie doke. So we are at two apiece at the moment. What a start. Kate, uh, another witch coming your way. Draguna, Macoides, Tricorum, Satis D. Nothing happened. Am I doing something wrong? I might be really embarrassing myself because I actually haven't seen this film <gasps> and I'm only going off the voice. Okay, go for it. Um, is that Angela Lansbury? Yeah, it is. In Angela bed Lans knobs and brooms. It surely is. Well done. <laughs> you have never seen this I've, movie. No, oh I've never Lord. seen bed knobs and broomsticks. No, yeah. We do love Angela. Well done. I thought by by your face as you were listening there that uh, maybe Michael was going to be able to steal some points there, but no, <laughs> you did it. You used your um, best Jessica Fletcher detective work, and you figured out that it indeed was nice. Miss Angela Lansbury. Fabulous. Well done, Kate. All right, which which Michael? You don't even exist to me! You don't even exist. You are nothing. You are shit. You don't exist. The only way you know how to treat women is by treating them like whores! When you're the whore! And that's gonna stop! There's a lot to process. I think there's a lot of really interesting <laughs> things spoken about. In Some points case. were made. Uh... Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's fresh in my mind. So I'm going to say the craft, but I, okay, I don't know. It is the craft. Yeah, I so you don't know who. It I is. I don't know who, and this is really irritating because myself and Kate off <laughs> offline we're talking about this movie, yes. and I just looked at the, oh. the the cast list, and I couldn't tell you anyone that was in it now because I was not properly focusing so I don't know that answer Kate do you know who that is I do it's Feruza Bulk in um, The Craft it is it is Feruza Bulk well done Ooh, making some okay. great points <laughs> yeah <laughs> certainly brilliant. making a lot of points <laughs> uh, she's wonderful in that film I, I love Feruza another uh, icon of Halloween but maybe more for the, the teenage uh, uh, or teenage generation. 
Wonderful. All right. So here comes another witch for Kate. By midnight tomorrow, bring me the items or that child you wish for. We'll never see the light of day. I have no idea. Nothing. No, you. The voice is giving you nothing. Um, I was going like, I was going to say something, but then I was like, oh, that's going to really embarrass myself because it's a film everyone's seen, Hocus Pocus. I was like, everyone's seen that and I haven't seen it. Yeah. It is, it is, like, Bette Midler is not a world away from this style of performance of this person, I would say. Certainly not, no. (laughs) No, no. So that would actually be a fair guess and and I I, I would accept that as a a, a noble effort. Um, But if you don't know, we might be handing it over to Michael for it. Steal your points. Is it, do you want to stab another guess at any name that it could be? Um, no, I think I'm okay. You're going to hand it. Okay, defeat. Michael, who do we have here? Um, so I wouldn't have known this other than I'm obsessed with the stage musical is based on. It's Into the Woods with Meryl Streep as the witch. It surely is Into the Woods with Meryl Streep with her who cares in <laughs> I have actually seen that. I just don't remember it. <laughs> yeah, no, she's really going for it. Here comes the final clip. And at this point, I will say, Michael, if you get this one, you are going to take the win. But there's still a chance if he blunders this, that there's room for a steal. But let's see what happens. Michael, which witch? My magic was the toast of Paris. You should have seen me before the war. I melted Salvador Dali's watch one time, right off his wrist. <laughs> that is the campiest thing I've heard. And only one woman could deliver it. And I'm assuming it's Kate Blanchett. But I, I, I only know the voice. I, I, it's probably except for the house of the clocks that tick or whatever that's called. Ooh, oh, what, the clock so, that ticks it, or something. <laughs> Oh, it's not what I'm talking about. There's a movie that has ticks, ticks, has clocks ticking, and I don't know the name of it. Well, it is Kate Blanchett, and you are you are on the right lines. Kate, do you want to give it a go? Do you know it? The clocks. Oh my god! Um... <laughs> it's very close. Oh my god! The the house where the clocks it. tick. <laughs> You're getting close. <laughs> this is unbearable. <laughs> The house where the clocks... Is it the ticking in the walls? Oh, oh my God. The yes. clocks are ticking in the walls. That's the clock in the walls. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm going to say Kate got in there just before you with a complete title. So I'm giving her... I love it. She does like the walls. <laughs> so what is it? The walls are ticking with the clocks. <laughs> the... <laughs> It's the house with the clock and its walls. The house with the clock yeah. and its walls. <laughs> oh my god. Guys. Oh, is it a real movie? We wonderful. don't know, but what a title. <laughs> we don't know, but that bit of it exists online, exactly. so enjoy. Um, well done, Michael, but it was a very, very close race. Uh, I wasn't sure how easy that would be for you both. Maybe you're super witch fans, uh, and it was a strong showing there. So uh, I tip my hat to both of you. And we didn't even decide what the prizes would be um, f- for a win. Well, this is going to say, and this is why I wanted to win, because this is really a prize for Kate. My prize, or your, my prize is your prize, is to encourage you to watch Bedknobs and Broomsticks. Oh, oh, absolutely. There we go. That's a great way of making this a win for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Bed knobs and broomsticks. Get that one teed up and, and let us know what you think, Kate. Um, but fabulous work on the quiz, everyone. So now I guess we have to round it all off by instead of <laughs> contemplating why Christina Ritchie's career may not have be hitting the heights that um, it once was to be planning her career. So, Kate, as I guessed, do you want to go first with what you would love to see Christina do in the future? Yeah, I would really like her to go back to kind of indie art house films um, and have this sort of, I know I keep mentioning kind of Mia Goth, but have sort of a pearl, campy, stylized, real performance film, because I think that that's where she really shines when she's kind of given these really offbeat roles. Um, and I think that um, 
as with the Renaissance, Brendan Fraser, <laughs> something like a smaller budget, but with a great script could could really suit her, I think. Um, and I don't know if it's maybe a conscious decision that she's made sort of in her later career to, to not have bigger roles. So it could be something that's nice to kind of ease her back into the kind of consciousness of younger people and, and things like that. Nice. I love that. Lovely. What about you, Scott? Uh, so for me, I'll start by saying where my mind went for a start, but then I have ended up traveling somewhere else is because of, I guess, the sort of Tim Burton-ness of it. I mean, it makes complete sense to me that she worked with Tim Burton in Sleepy Hollow. She feels like, uh, since playing Wednesday Adams, he would have been like her and I need her immediately, especially at that point in time in the nineties. But then if we think of things of a similar, um, sort of aesthetic I couldn't shake the TV show Pushing Daisies and if that was to be remade in any way also because she is the same sort of age as Lee Pace I think I mean Anna Frill is wonderful in Pushing Daisies but if we were to to kind of do a swap I think that would be a fair swap um, if it was to ever resurface and, and Anna Frill for whatever reason couldn't make it um, but where I ended up going to and I'm not quite sure what the routing is here because it's very different but um I do sort of like when she gets to do the more stripped back things. And a director who we haven't seen from in a wee while now is Andrew Haig, director of 45 Years and um, Weekend um, and Lean on Pete most recently in terms of his film work. He has a film upcoming called um, Strangers, which sounds absolutely terrific about... Um, a guy who's, I think his parents maybe pass away and then he ends up getting drawn back to the family house and the parents are still there in some capacity. And I was like, oh gosh, this is very interesting. What sort of spin might we see on this with an air of kind of things that we got in the likes of 45 years? And I'm going to go really specific with this and say that it, it, it's a drama where we follow a woman played by uh, Christina Ricci who lives in a small isolated village that could be in somewhere like Scotland perhaps or Ireland uh, if we must. Um, and then we follow her as she meets a man that comes into town. They have a kind of a whirlwind night or weekend together. See, I'm already playing on things he's done before. Um, and then after this, he kind of, he has to go out of town, leaves the details, etc., etc. She wakes up the next morning, she goes into town and she finds out this man never existed. But she can't come to terms with that and she tries to track him down. Who is this man? Um, where is he? I refuse to believe that this was not a real moment in my life. Um, and Andrew Hayes going to direct that. So I'm real specific, but I'm now very, very excited for this film and truly hope that by putting it out into the, the uh, universe that it might come true. I love that too. Mine um, is more mainstream, but I thought this could be an, a fun way of bringing her back to like family films, but giving her, like around her personality or what we perceive to be her personality, I guess, um, on screen. And it is doing a Muppets version of Sleepy Hollow where Christina Rishi <gasps> plays Ichabod Crane. Ichabod Crane? And so, it you know, it, the story of Sleepy Hollow is like this kind of, like in the original book, not the Tim Burton film, he's um, this kind of nerdy teacher and um, people are like, think he's odd, they're kind of laughing at him and then sp kind of spooky things happen. I just love the, I like, I love say Muppets Christmas Carol and take it when the Muppets take a story and make it their own, but with somebody with big personality in like a lead part like Michael Caine in the Christmas Carol. So I would love to see that. And I think Christina Rishi would be perfect. And as you've just mentioned, Pushing Daisies, let's get Brian Fuller to direct it because it could have perfect. this kind of like really playful energy. Um, I can just imagine it. I just like imagine all the Muppets all around in the town and these spooky things start happening. Yeah, I'd like that a lot. I love it. I'd love that. I love anything Muppets and always welcome anything uh, of that. Not enough Muppets nowadays. No, I, I don't. They keep, but like, didn't Disney buy it and try to like, they did that really great film and with Amy Adams and that man. <laughs> that man, that is his name, I don't remember. <laughs> um, that man. And then they did a sequel and that was it. But I feel like they should be trying to do more, basically. Yeah, I think they were both solid, especially the first of those films. So I welcome mm. anything that they want to do. Come I back. also, I forgot to say, I would love to see Christina Ricci play a mother. 
I'm not in ten things we should do before whatever. Yeah. <laughs> before the, wall, the, the ticking the in the wall. Yeah, ten things before the ticking in the walls. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would love to see her play a convincing mother because I think it would be really nice. Full circle. No, I would love that. And do you have a director that you'd like to see Christina work with? A director I'd like to see Christina work with? Hmm. Um, I'd love to see her reunited with uh, Patty. Yeah. Uh, oh, perfect. Would be great. Perfect I think choice. that would be perfect. Yeah. Um, but I think that um, some sort of real life mother-daughter story directed by Patty with Christina, I'm calling her Patty like I know her, sorry. Ms. We all do. Um, <laughs> Um, but I think some sort of real life story, Christina Ricci, with an unknown kind of child actor who's sort of around Christina Ricci Mermaid's age would be just fantastic. I think nice. that would be really wonderful. Yeah. Oh, well, sign me up for that, please. <laughs> yeah. There's some, I think Christina could like slot into so many different people's yeah. um, work. I, I Yeah. I, I really hope that she does have the... Um, kind of comeback trajectory of someone like Brendan Fraser, um, mm. and sure we'll see. Hopefully, as as we did Brendan Fraser, and now he's likely to be nominated for an Oscar. Perhaps we've yeah. done an episode of Christina Rishi, and she'll be nominated for an Oscar in a year's time too. Yeah, coming, yay! And thank you again, Kate, for joining and for bringing um, Christina. You yeah. are very welcome to come back another time. When you've seen Bed Knobs and Bring Sticks, and um, yes. we'll talk about only another then. movie. <laughs> yeah, only then. And we'll talk about another <laughs> actor, even. Um, yeah, I had so much fun. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank oh, you awesome. so much for coming. It's been a pleasure, Kate. And is there anything you want to shout about out, like you want people to look at or follow you or pay attention to? <sighs> Please don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Follow me home. Um, no, um, I just yeah. No, I'm. Uh, yeah, I, I, I make theater. So hopefully, I'll have a show coming out at some stage. I'm working on fiction podcasts for a friend. So hopefully, this is. But this has been great. It's just. Um, it's been sort of really refreshing to work with a friend and uh, talking about something that I love that I don't get to talk about enough, mm. which is film. Yeah. Yeah. And Scott, where can people find us? Uh, so if you would like to find us, you can do that. Um, not by following us home in the ways that you might with Kate. Uh, you can get us on social media at uh, on Instagram or Twitter at don'tknowher underscore pod. Or you can email us at don'tknowherpod at gmail.com. Please do not follow Kate home. Yes. Thank you. No, no one being Casper. <laughs> Um, yeah, and please do hashtag. Exactly. Let's get this hashtag trending. Guys. Oh my god! Don't, <laughs> don't be a cast. <laughs> don't be Casper. Um, be, don't be a Casper. Yeah, don't be an unfriendly ghost. Um, no. Or a friendly ghost. That's the problem. Um, yeah, and you can you can please rate, review us, sh- tell friends about us, <laughs> our podcast. Even don't tell them about our personal <laughs> life. <laughs> um, it's a real theme, stalkers. Exactly. We don't want any of that. Um, we just want kind things um <laughs> i just can't think of words um so yeah thanks everybody thank you guys again and yeah have a good rest of your day wherever you're listening thanks all bye bye